Hello everyone, welcome to Coders Arts YouTube channel. So today in this video, this is the part 3 of your art tutorial. In this video, we are going to discuss about the remaining topics. That is, we are going to discuss about the data structures, the three data structures which were remaining. We have learnt about list data structure, uh, vector data structure and we have also seen how to make a data frame in R. Now, in this video, we are going to have a look at data structures like matrices, arrays, and also have a look at something called as factors. So, before we get into this video, firstly, before starting your uh, remaining data structures, let me he uh, help you understand that in the previous video, we were learning how to create a data frame and how we can add different rows and new columns to our data frame. So, you have uh, learned about the R bind function in our previous video. In this video, let me, in continuation to that, help you understand how we can add rows and columns. So, before that is started. Let's me, uh, let me open this R Studio app for you so that any kind of practical demonstration I can show it to you in this R Studio. So recap of your uh, basically a recap of your uh, pro, uh, uh, previous lecture. We can see that this is what we were doing in the last video. That is uh, we created the first data frame of R's using this command data.frame. This is the way C followed by C function followed by the parameter as the number, the sequence of numbers 1 is to 5, that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is how we create a vector. So employee ID, employee name, salary, start date are the four vectors of our data frame. And then after doing this, we create another data frame and to bind the two data frames, we have used something called as the R bind function. This is what exactly I'm going to start with in this video as well, that how we can use the R bind function. So basically, what is this R bind function and why is it so important in R? So R, R, R bind function is the function which is used for binding basically two data frames. So whenever you want to add rows to a data frame, you have to make sure that your first data frame and your next data frame. So whatever new rows you are adding to your existing data frame, you have to make the new rows in the form of a data frame. So when you store all your new rows in the form of a data frame, the second data frame can be merged or binded with your first existing data frame using this R bind function and then you can print your merged data frame. So that what we have seen in our previous lecture. So in this video, whenever you want to add rows, this R bind function is something very important you have to keep in mind. So if you say if uh, data frame A has variables that has data, that data frame B does not, then either you can delete the extra variables in data frame A because data frame A has some variables which are extra or you can create additional variables in data frame B by appending or adding new variables to data frame B. But what about the values to those variables? You are created and adding the variables to data frame B. But then you have, what about the values? So the values, you can set them to NA, which is nothing but not, uh, nothing but uh, something like not present or not applicable. You write, you know the full form of NA. So setting them to NA implies it is a missing value or to null value, nothing. So NA is nothing but null value or missing value. So the value assigned to the Additional variables you create in data frame B is set to NA before joining them with R bind. So once that is done, you can make use of this function like R bind, then data frame 1, data frame 2, bind them together as we have seen in the practical demonstration as well. That uh, we have done R bind on M dot data was the first data frame, second data frame was M dot new data. On binding them together, we will see that the final merged data frame will be a combination of having the rows of both the data frames. So this is something you have to understand. Now, what about the uh, adding row? As I've told, R bind is the function. This is the demo of that uh, existing video, uh, existing uh, program. We have written the same thing. M dot data is the first data frame. M dot new data is our second frame data frame and you're creating data frame by writing data dot frame which is the function and inside that you are passing in the vectors individually so you can see the columns are present as vectors over here now when you're binding the two data frames r bind comes into the picture this after executing your code as required you will see this uh, data frame having all these columns and the fifth column also which is the dept column as that was also in the second data frame the second data frame we had the dept column and as well in the first data frame we had the dept column so you uh, after doing this we get this data frame. Now, what about merging columns? So, this was the way in which we add rows. So, adding rows, R bind is the function in order to add new rows 
uh, in the same structure as the existing data frame. What about merging columns? For merging columns, for example, we have two data frames, DF1 in this form and DF2 in this form. So when we print DF1, this is the way we get because we have the only the customer ID. So we have the customer ID and the product, which are the two columns. So customer ID is a vector having one to six as the numbers and product has rows that is nothing but v, rep. Rep is, start, uh, rep is a function for repeating. So whenever you want to basically repeat a particular string or a particular value of a variable of an element present in a vector three times. So you can use toaster or comma three. It will repeat and uh, append the uh, variable having the name as toaster three times because rep means repeat. So if you do rep of radio comma three three times radio will get repeated had you kept instead of three four or five then three or four or five times you will see radio being repeated so the number of times or the frequency of that will be uh, given as the second um, second uh, parameter to your rep function so this is the way in which you're creating both the data frames and uh, before getting started uh, into the different kinds of joins, let me help you understand. See, what is exactly joins? As you know, in SQL, like drawing an analogy or uh, comparison with SQL language, you will know that uh, whenever you want to merge or basically merge two uh, columns or merge two columns of two tables, then in order to do that, you make use of joins because joins help you to pull data from two or more tables, right? Now, over here, instead of tables, we have something called as a data frame. So whenever you are merging columns from two or more data frames, that is where joins come into the picture. And the types of joins are inner join, outer join, left join, right join, and cross join. Let me uh, show you with the help of an example. Firstly, uh, like... Okay, so this is the two data frames we had created. Now, uh, on this two data, frame, instead of printing it, we have this m.final data. Let me say that, uh, let me create another vector for you to help you understand. Suppose we, uh, vec1 is equal to C, uh, let me give some uh, something like in, inside your vector, I'm adding another parameter rep. rep because that is rep stands for repeating so i do i'm very uh, lazy to write all the numbers which are repeating or all the basically let's take uh, the strings which are repeating so instead of writing them all the uh, again and again i can just use this rep function to simplify my work so if i say i want to uh, write i want the elements to be 3 and repeating it by eight times. So basically they are like three, 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 three and so on. Eight times three is repeated in the elements list. So I can create a vector like this. And if another vector, I want uh, the name, something like uh, tutorial. Tutorial is the string which I want to repeat uh, five times. So this is your vec1. Now if I print vec1 or just say vec1, let's see whether it's going to repeat or give us the expected result or the expected um uh, kind of a vector or not. So as expected in the console pane, you will see vec1 as three repeated eight times because we are using the rep function. Now I hope you understood why we are using rep function, right? Rep function is used for assigning values to a variable or to the elements of a vector and it is for repeating. So whenever you want to repeat uh, elements of a vector, you use the rep function. Now tutorial is repeated. Uh, you will see here that uh, uh, since we ha have the vector and inside of this is a vector having another vector inside it. Now another vector inside it, we have seen this vector tutorial is not having rep function in it, right? So tutorial comma five will just be treated as separate elements only of the vector. But because we are not repeating this tutorial five times as we didn't use rep over here, rep. But then over here, since we have used the rep function uh, for repeating three, the third, uh, element three eight times so that is why you will see three repeated eight times whereas tutorial is only written once and five is also written once because we did not use the rep uh, rep function or the rep command i hope i have made this clear to you now coming back to uh, the joins so basically let me explain you what are different joins so as the word says inner join this is the function for you in R that is whenever you want to merge two data frames as we were doing that like m dot data and m dot new data we merge them together right we basically uh, R bind R bind is the function to basically merge two data frames they're uh, adding the rows basically so similarly over here when we use merge instead of R bind we use merge is the command 
when we want to merge two data frames and their columns together or add the new different columns to a data frame. So merge df comma uh, df one comma df two by is equal to custom id to keep only rows that match from the data frame. So inner join is something like a intersection operation in maths. You must have heard about sets in mathematics. So you have something called as intersection union. Right. So whenever I say intersection, this is something like an intersection where whatever is uh, is matching. Or uh, in the df one and df two two data frames, whichever is the matching. Uh, rows only those will be retrieved by this inner join and those rows only will be kept so all your matching rows from the two data frames df1 and df2 will be uh, kept in your uh, result final output result of your inner join and that they are matched by which column they are matched by the customer id column customer id column is common to both df1 and df2 if you see df1 has customer id and product as the column df2 has customer id and state as the column so since customer id is common you always match the rows or the records based on the common column and the common column is nothing but the customer id which will help you to find the intersection of the rows or basically the intersection result of uh, merging both your data frames coming to outer join outer join is nothing but using same it's like merge only merging two data frames you can give it this way x is equal to df1 y equal to df2 by equal to custom id this is same till here but we write all equal to true and then to keep all the rows from both data frames so all equal to true is some extra parameter we are adding in order to keep all the rows from both the data frames you want outer join is something like your union operation in sets you can see that because we are keeping irrespective of whether they are matching by the customer id or not all the rows from both the data frames will be kept we will execute one by one so let us say in a join we will execute and see what will be the uh, output going back to this so since now we have let me remove back one because we don't need it right now and uh, final uh, data okay let me remove the final um, m dot final data as well we don't need the uh, rows the bounded rows and we don't need the merged uh, data frame we have two data frames now m dot data m dot Uh, new data and whenever say let me create a result result df or result data frame equal to merge of df1 comma df2 now what is this df1 and df2 df1 is nothing but okay this is result by the way make sure the variable names you can although you can keep them anything but then it's always understandable for the user so that that will be better uh, you should follow the industry standards so that uh, whatever variables are there they are clear concise and depict what they are using you know, what they are doing so since we are something like result df where it be uh, you are combining the columns of both your data frames so df1 what is it what is the name of your df1 df1 is m dot data df2 is m dot new data so let's give that df1 df2 so instead of we can write like this also df1 is equal to m dot data and df2 is the variable for m dot new data and you are merging them by uh, customer id so this will be nothing but your inner join because you are not having another parameter called all equal to true you are only merging the two data frames together based on a uh, intersection between them that is the common based on the matching records or the matching rows um, on your customer id by taking the customer id column so let's print result df and see how are exactly the result will be displayed and this is nothing but your inner join let us do this on running this command you will see error and merge uh, m dot data not found okay so we have to run this entirely because the our history i had quit the session previously so on running this entirely together yes you will see result is equal to error in as dot data dot frame argument x is missing with no default okay we have made the something like a function so instead of like you know uh, making it as a function let's give it to be something like uh, m dot data and m dot new data we will remove df1 and df2 instead of keeping that as uh, variables let us execute this and check on running this 
error in as.data.frame argument text is missing by must specify a uniquely valid column. So the valid column over here is not customer ID. If you see here, that customer ID was not even present. So what is a common ID, a common uh, column? Column can, we can take it as emp ID instead of customer ID. So let's say emp ID, emp underscore ID, emp underscore ID. And also by must specify uniquely valid. Now uniquely valid column is given m underscore id object result df not found because um, that is declared here. And then error argument x is missing with no default. m dot data and what is the name? m dot data. Yes. Let us run this entirely together. Yes, now you will see as expected your output here. So basically always make sure that whenever you are running any R uh, script, make sure that the valid data variable names is used. So the, since we did not have customer ID, we had changed that to m underscore ID, which is present in both your data frames. Then remove the two variables, df1 and df2. We, we use that for union or uh, I mean for your outer join. But for your inner join, we don't have to specify explicitly df1 and df2 uh, and uh, assign them with these uh, values. We can just call the two data frames, something like in your R bind, when you were like merging two rows, uh, the rows of the two data frames, you used R bind. Similar to that only, you can make use of the merge function and m dot data, m dot new data are the parameters for that. And then you will see that your result df is this, which is having m id, m name dot x, salary dot x, start date dot x, and this is your final uh, data frame. So this is basically for merging all your columns. You will see all your columns here have been merged, but not the rows, right? Because there's no matching between your two rows because this is by equal to emp id. So when we see emp id, emp id, uh, it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1 to 5 is in your data frame 1. In your second data frame, you have 6 to 8. Is there any common um, uh, uh, common value? There is no common value because 1 to 5 is different and 6 to 8 is different. Because there is no intersection found, you will see that there are no rows also retrieved by your inner join. Because inner join will also always give you something uh, which is always in the intersection or in your common. That is common or matching records only. So if there is no matching records, it will just give you empty rows data frame but all your columns have been merged as expected now let's say you want to uh, do the outer join now how do you do the outer join you specify in your outer join you specify like this something like this if you see here x is equal to df1 y equal to df2 by and then all equal to true so this is something different right why all equal to true? To, to keep all your rows from both the data frame something like a union so let's add that uh, argument here that is all equal to true. And this is uh, R is case sensitive language. So make true everything as capital because uh, some small letter is treated as differently than capital letters. So make sure this is set correctly. Now let's say X is equal to this and Y equal to this. Now you do this X is equal to this Y equal to this. Yes, as expected, you will see your uh, output of your uh, outer join that all the columns have been merged and all the records are also been uh, present here. So irrespective of whether they are matching or not, if they are not matching, uh, if there is any missing value, in that case, NA is something which you will impute your missing value with, right? So missing values are given by the value of NA. You can see this is the result. All the columns of your both the data frames have been merged and uh, you will see something like your union operation. 1 to 5 was the uh, employee ID for your first data frame, 6 to 8 for your second data frame. So 1 to 8 is in your combination or in your result data frame. So this is the output of your outer join. I hope I have made inner join and out, outer join difference clear to you. To something like your intersection and your union operation in sets. Coming to the left outer and the right outer join, before I get into left and right outer join, let me under, help you to understand what is full outer join or full inner join. Full outer join is same as your outer join only and full inner join is something that's synonymous to your inner join. That is one thing. And what is natural join and other, if you have heard in SQL and all. So in in R, there is nothing called as natural join. In R, you have something called as your cross join. And cross join is nothing but like a cross product or a Cartesian product of both of your data frames. 
you can consider or treat your data frame as a table okay like you have tables in the relational database management system here you have data frames so when merging or when using the cross join it is like merge x is equal to df1 y equal to df2 by equal to null because you are uh, just simply you know instead of finding the common uh, the matching records from both the data frames you just implement this and there is no criteria that both of them should always match if you just keep it like in, if you just remove all equal to true and you say by equal to null so null means by uh, null means nothing right so it means by there is no uh, criteria set that based on a particular field or a particular column only the intersect the uh, result uh, resulting rows should be retrieved it's nothing like that you should retrieve the result from both the rows right uh, in your cross join something like your cartesian product and uh, you can just specify x is equal to this and y equal to by equal to null now when i execute this command you will see a difference here and then you can compare how different is the uh, output for your outer join and your cross join now you will be surprised and you will be seeing that there is no na present at all because in the outer join you have you have specified explicitly that always the matching should happen by the employee id only by the employee id column but in this case the matching regardless of your employee id it it should just happen that is all the records from both the data frames should be retrieved so in your outer join result you saw na also present in your output but in your uh, uh, this one cross join you will see there is no na present rather there is a lot of redundancy also and there is repetition also that is the we can say this some kind of like disadvantage of your cross join and cross joins are little bit um, uh, time taking as well so whenever you come to optimizing your queries or your commands there are different tactics and strategies to do that but you will see that one advantage is that there is no missing values present in your cross join so that there is no uh, no need to further clean the data whenever you're working with higher humongous amount of data or databases so you can just simply use this cross join which is a cartesian product it simply results a cartesian product of your two data frames so you will see this as the output of your cross join now we will go back to the uh, outer join which is the left outer join and right outer join you will see left outer join to include all the rows of your data frame x that is your left all the rows of your first data frame will be given and only the matching records or the matching rows from your second data frame will be given in the left outer join on the other hand in the right outer join you will see that all the rows on your right or on your second data frame will be retrieved but only the matching records or the matching rows from your left data frame will be retrieved that is in the right outer join let us execute this and one thing is that all dot x is set to true because you want the records of your first data frame to be retrieved uh, for sure so that is why all dot x is set to true in right outer join all dot y is set to true now what is x and y x is for your left or left data frame that is for your first data frame and y is for your right data frame that is for your uh, second data frame let us execute this command so that we will then be done with uh, uh, what uh, what is add and all that now you will see the uh, there is a uh, output for you df1 that is df1 is custom id and product df2 is custom id and state this is some output which is shown to you how exactly what df1 and df2 looks like your two data frames now once this is done we will be over with data frames adding rows and then we can go to the remaining data structures that is arrays matrices and factors now let's say instead of this we have something like merge x is equal to df1 what is df1 df1 is m dot data df2 is m dot new data by equal to m by d it, because there is no custom id here we have m by d so you are matching them by m by d and check the spelling of empire is correct or not 
yes it is correct all dot x is equal to true because you want all your uh, uh, records of your uh, first data frame should be retrieved but only the matching records of your second data frame now as expected you will see all the records of your second data frame will be set to na because there is no match at all as we have seen in the intersection operation or the inner join there were zero records which were returned why is that so because there is not at all any intersection or no matching records found between your first data frame and your second data frame so in your second data frame all the records of your second data frame will be set to na na stands for missing values whereas uh, you will see all the records whichever you are assigned in your first data frame those will be retrieved as expected in your left outer join now say that instead of all dot x is equal to let me make it all dot y equal to 2 all dot y equal to 2 true is for your right outer join there is no much difference between left outer join and right outer join there's some simply like left outer join means all your um the records of your first data frame will be given will be expected will be retrieved here but na will be given or uh, for any unmatched records of your second data frame but in your right outer join as the name says right it will favor the right data frame right so all your right data frame that is all your records present in the right data frame or the second data frame will be retrieved and in the left data frame only the matching records will be retrieved so as expected you will see in your left outer join all it is given as na 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 but in your right outer join it will retrieve so in your left outer join as you have you have seen in left outer join 1 to 5 was the rows because it was only returning the rows from your left outer join uh, left table or from your uh, first data frame but in the right outer join all the records from your uh, second data frame will be retrieved so that is why it's giving the records with numbers 6 to 8 and then uh, all the values for your columns in the first data frame will be set to NA because there is no match found and all the columns in your second data frame will be given, uh, will be retrieved as it is with their corresponding values. I hope I have made the concept of data frames very clear to you and how joins work, how adding columns works and so on. Uh, now we will go to arrays, then we will go to uh, the matrices and then finally vectors which are the remaining uh, uh, data structures in R and finally we'll be having a look into op what are operators and for loops so that that will wrap up entirely your programming and your R tutorial because once you understand all these basic fundamentals it will be very easy for you to program basically use R programming for performing statistical operations and so on. So this tutorial was for you to understand and get acquainted with all the programming concepts of R, get familiar with R Studio, how what exactly operations can be done with R Studio, the basic functions. And also I was explaining you in the previous lectures, the previous videos I had demonstrated how you can de uh, define your own user defined functions, right? You can, for example, area of a rectangle or a square, how you can basically uh, assign your uh, inputs and uh, parameters to your use defined functions how you can make use of the inbuilt data sets and perform data analysis operations as i've explained exploratory data analysis can be done you can plot graphs and data visualization so on for data analytics everything has been covered so let's uh, wrap up everything about the data structures in this particular video so let's say uh, arrays is the next data uh, structure so what exactly is an array and how do we create it now if you know array can store data in more than two dimensions as well they can be two cross two array two cross three array and so on but uh, you have to understand the difference between array and list is that unlike lists list which can store uh, elements of different data types they can contain heterogeneous data types arrays can only store or data of only a single data type so the data type you cannot have like uh, this for example this is a vector of different lengths right a vector having all numbers an array can only and uh, only contain the uh, elements of the same data type so it can only it can only be an array if it contains two vectors it cannot contain one vector one list one matrix or different different uh, elements different types of elements it is homogeneous in nature because it can only store a single data type so and uh, to create an array you use the array function here similar to how you are using for list for vector matrix and so on array you use the array function and then uh, array is also a combination of uh, vectors only so you pass in your uh, input to the array function you pass in as vectors only so this is vector 1 and vector 2 which you are passing in then the dimension is one important parameter you have to pass in as argument or as a parameter to your array function 
Now, what is this para? Uh, what is this basically dimension? Dimension is nothing but your uh, pa, uh, in order to create an array. For example, if you say three, three, two, it means you are going to create three cross three matrices. Two, three cross three matrices. It's like that. So you're creating an array of two. Uh, three cross three matrices. This is the number. Uh, first argument is the number of rows. The second three is the number of columns. Two is the number of the array. So you are creating an array of two three cross three matrices, each with three rows and three columns. When you see the output, you will see something like this. The execution of the above code will result this, which is uh, you will see five, ten, uh, five, uh, nine. So as I have told, whenever you are combining any vectors and so on, they will be always be appended vertical format. So 5, 9, 3 like this, 5 followed by 9 followed by 3 in this column format, then 10, 11, 12 and so on up to 15. So uh, this is one way. The second way is also this, you're basically creating two matrices which are exactly same. Okay, this will be output of this uh, array. So let me execute this function for you. Uh, this program for you so you will understand how we can create arrays then then we'll go to naming columns and naming rows instead of giving like this also you can give a particular name to your different vectors to your different array also or uh, vectors of different lengths and then you can take the vectors as input to the array and then you can even make a list of it so basically converting a uh, you know converting a array to a list how can that be done simply use the list function you can do that to convert an array to a list and then that's let me first help uh, help you with understanding this so i have just created two vectors vector one vector two and then uh, the result vector is nothing but an array of the two vectors which you have created let me clear this right so when you are doing this, let us execute this, you will see two matrices created. Now instead of two, let's say you are will want to create three matrices. Okay, three matrices you want to create and you want to give three cross three dimension only. Or let's say instead of three cross uh, three, let's make it as two cross three. And let's see what is the output. On running this, you will see this is your output in the console. You will see three matrices or three uh, matrices as expected because you have specified three in the last. You will see two rows. So each matrix is only having two rows. It's not having three rows. It's just having two rows, but three columns. Okay. So as expected, you will see two rows, three columns in each of your matrix. This is the way in which you can create matrix uh, arrays of uh, different sizes as well. Now coming to creating two vectors of different lengths, this is the way you can create, uh, you can basically take vectors as input to the array as well, something like this. And in, in order to convert uh, into a list, you can make use of the list function and write row.names, call.names, matrix.names. Because what are these? Call.name, row.name, matrix, and they are nothing but vectors only, right? They are vectors having strings as elements. So whenever you are combining them into a result, so array, array is having this with dimensions and the time names. What is the dimension names basically? The dimension names is nothing but stored in the list form and the list of row, column, matrix. So instead of if, if you see this over here, you have the uh, the dimension, you have the row and the column names as one, two, three, and the uh, in the form of numeric. But if you want to give a name to your uh, row index or the column index, you can do that by making use of the dimension names function. So when you write D I M N A M, that is uh, dim name, dime names or dimension names, you can use this particular keyword dime names is equal to and then assign it to a list of row names, column names and matrix names. This will be so you can see here all your uh, row name which is having this row 1, row 2, row 3 will be given it as your dimension names for your rows. For your column names, you will see call 1, call 2, call 3 as expected. This is your result. This is one way to just, you know, basically uh, whenever you want uh, your output to be in a more presentable and understandable format, you can make use of this function. Now, what about accessing array elements? We have seen how to access data frame elements, how to access the list elements, vector elements in order to access your array elements. Uh, so this you have created an array over here result having the array right you have also provided with the dimension names the list of row names column names and the matrix names if you want to print the third row of the second matrix of the array now see carefully look at this third row third row means three over here as the first argument second matrix of the array is in the second argument so that is why you are writing three comma comma two 
But what about if you want to print the element in the first row and the third column of the first matrix? Since it is the first matrix, you are specifying the um, basically the the number the number of the matrix is specified last. So if you see over here, second matrix is specified as the last. It basically takes three arguments: the the num the row number, the second argument is the column number, and third argument is the matrix number so the matrix number is one here which we have specified here at the end then the element in the first row the row number is one we have mentioned here the column number is three we have mentioned here in the first in this example if you see print the third row of the second matrix of the array it is not specifying which column number so that is why we have kept just a simple uh, you know uh, we have not um, given any column number to it just a simple uh, missing value we can say so three comma comma two so the third row, row number is three, column number is nothing because it's not specified in this uh, question or in this comment and the matrix number is two. And similarly over here, if you see there is no number and no uh, column number, no row number, no column number in your third case. So print the second matrix means only the matrix number is given. So we can just say comma, comma, two because two is the matrix number. Corresponding to this, you will get the output as expected. This is a way in which you can access array elements. Now to manipulate array elements, these are different ways. Like, uh, it can contain matrices in multiple dimensions. The operations on elements of array are carried out by accessing elements of the matrices. So whenever you want to access, so what do you say by manipulating? Manipulating means you can either update the elements of the array, you can take them as vectors and then merge two vectors also like if you see array 2 you can basically assign it to some array an array can be instead of assigning it uh, to a different vector you can also assign the first array to your second array that can also be done and then you can also access the elements present in your matrices or your array to add to add the matrices basically if you see this is a matrix from these arrays so this is matrix 1 which is having uh, this is the array. So matrix has three dimensions as we have seen before. It has the row number, column number and the numbers of the matrix. So if you see here, comma, comma, two and then uh, matrix two is having this as is. So whenever you want to add the matrices together in a resulting matrix, you simply concatenate them by making use of the plus operator. So when you use a plus operator, matrix one plus matrix two, you will see your output as expected here. Uh, let me finish this so that we I can show you practically how this can all be done and you can perform different manipulations in your array. Then if you see calculations across any array elements, you can use of the apply function here. So apply function, if you see, it is used for basically manipulations in your array. So apply x, comma margin, comma fun, where x is your array, name of your array. Margin is the name of the data set used and fun is the function to be applied across the elements of the array. So that is... Uh, something like if you are if you are familiar with pandas, you will uh, come across this apply function there as well, where you are passing in the data set followed by the function name. But in R, you are passing in three parameters to your apply function. First is your array name. Second is your name of the data set. So in this case, it's margin. The third is your function to be applied across all the elements of your array. So this is a uh, vector one, vector two. Uh, if you see in our uh, demo as well, this was our vector one, uh, vector two, resulting vector, which is an array of both your vectors. Then if you see this in this case, so if you basically see in over here, three comma three comma two, and then finally using the apply function to calculate the sum of the rows across all matrices, you will see apply new dot array c of 1 comma sum because basically sum what is sum sum is the function we have written above if you see uh, over here sum was the function we have written above where we are adding the two uh, elements so sum is an inbuilt function in r so you need not explicitly you know make a user defined function you can also just write sum over here r will understand and take it to be sum of the um, rows across the matrices of uh, some of some of the rows across the both the matrices so uh, new dot array is your array you're using C of 1 is the data set, right? So it's the data set. And then what is the data set? So C of 1 is nothing but this one. It is uh, it is nothing but a vector only. A data set which can be margin is the name of the data set used. Data set can be any data you want to manipulate, right? And it can be an array. It can be a vector. It can be a matrix. It can be anything or a data frame also. In our case, we have in this code, we have made use of a vector. Only one is there, vector C of 1. Then on executing, we'll get this result as expected on using the apply function. So, so this is a case in which we can apply a specific function. In this case, sum is applied. We are applying a specific function to new dot array. Now, what is new dot array? 
if you see new dot array it is a combination of both the vectors 5 9 3 10 11 12 so on right if you see here also 5 9 3 and so on it is exactly that but whenever you are uh, basically applying the sum function and the data is c of 1 then as expected you will see this is the output of your array where you are applying the sum function so it is to calculate the sum of the elements in the rows of an array across all the matrices it will calculate the sum of the elements in the rows of the array so on executing this you will see the result basically after executing you will see the result sum of the all the elements as it says what is the sum function firstly you should understand sum of the elements in the rows of an array so it means rows of an array means you are adding row by right row wise so 5 plus 10 plus 13 that is summing up to 15 plus 13 and similarly, if you see 5 plus 9 plus 3, it is 8 plus 9, this is 17. And then adding it together, when you see it is going to be this thing and 6. So 56 will be your output as expected here. Similarly, if you add all the elements row by row, then you are going to get as expected. So similar, apart from some, you could have applied a different function also and uh, even a user defined function, it can be or a built in function also, you can make sure that the function can be anything. And the criteria for that can be set by you, the logic can be set by you and corresponding output. So basically, what I was explaining you was the apply function, which is basically used over here to apply a particular function to all the elements of a particular data structure, a particular array in our case. So x the name of the array, followed by the data set you're using and then the function to be applied across all the elements of your array so let us now practically uh, explain i'll practically explain you so let's go with uh, i was i had explained you this one now manipulating array elements so let me explain you how we can manipulate the array elements so if you see this is your Two uh, this is this is basically your uh, vectors of different lengths vector 1 and vector 2 you have created then you are taking the two vectors as input to the array see array function is always containing two vectors array is also a combination of vector like your matrix only so it's going to come containing a combination of your vectors even a data frame we have seen as a combination of vectors so vector is a very important uh, part of r is something you have to understand then vector 3 is this vector 4 similarly array 2 is a combination of your vector 3 and vector 4 we can create a matrix on these arrays and how is a matrix created array 1 matrix which is having this dimension array 2 matrix having this particular dimension then adding the two matrices that is matrix 1 plus matrix 2 and then printing your result so let's run this code and then you will see this is the output 10, 20, 26, 18, 22, 28, 6, 24, 30. And why is that so? Uh, if you see, it is element by element wise operation. So if you see on printing result, result is nothing but the sum of your two matrices. And your two matrices sum, if you see, is nothing but uh, 9 over here. If you add all the element by element wise. So if you do 5, 9, 3 is there. And if you add them together up 5 plus 1, then it's going to be uh, 5 plus over here 9 3 and then 10 11 12 right so 9 plus 1 is 10 and plus 12 11 plus 9 is 20 if you see the c uh 9 plus 11 is 20 and uh, 5 uh 9 plus 1 is 10 and so on you will see the corresponding sum of the element wise basically element wise numbers being added and then the uh the resulting matrix will contain the sum of your both the matrices so this is one way in which you can basically perform manipulations on your matrices and on your arrays. So I hope I have made the concept of matrices clear to you. Now coming to the next concept, which is called as matrices. This is your next data type in your R. Um, what is matrix basically? It is very much similar to your array. Now, what is the difference for writing or for creating a matrix? You use a matrix function. It is an R object in which the elements are arranged in a two dimensional rectangular layout. They contain elements of the same atomic type. So it's similar to an array only. It is not heterogeneous. Okay. It is not like a list where you can contain vectors of different data types. It is containing elements of the same data type. And so it is called as homogeneous. So 
uh, the we use matrices containing numeric elements to be used in mathematical calculations and a matrix is created using the matrix function now this is a matrix format you can just uh, pass in the parameters like data which is your input vector which becomes the data elements of your matrix n row is the number of rows of your matrix to be kept n column is the number of columns and dime names is the names assigned to the rows and columns this is optional parameter dime names is the optional parameter for you and by row is one important function which is a logical clue so this is one parameter of your matrix if true then the input vector elements are arranged by row now this depends on you if you want to arrange your elements row by row by row or by column if you are uh, writing by row equal to false then r will take it to be that the vectors or the vector or the elements of your uh, matrix have to be arranged in column format which is a default case we were seeing right uh, like a sequential uh, arrangement will be happening in the column format vertically but if you want that uh, by row equal to 2 if you said that like that then r will take it uh, to be that, that the input vector elements are arranged by row that is horizontally instead of vertically now this is optional for you dime names by row uh, but n row and n column is something very important because you should specify the number of rows your matrix should have and the number of columns your matrix should have and data is actually your input vector which becomes the data elements all your uh, matrix elements which you want to store in your matrix that is passed as data to your matrix function now let's uh, work with this now if you see elements are arranged sequentially by row let me execute this command for you and show you in our studio if you see m is equal to matrix 3 to 14 it will contain all your elements 3 to 14 in a matrix so if you see uh, all the elements and then number of rows is 4 number of uh, and the by row equal to true means all of them will be arranged sequentially so if you see that is horizontally here 3 4 5 6 7 8 view in if it set by row equal to false then it would have been 3 4 5 that is column way in in the form of a vertical which is the default actually we were seeing that sequential format uh, arrangement will be happening uh, in column format that is one after the other one below the other it will happen but then since we have set by row equal to true we will see that 3 4 5 instead of being in a column uh, arrangement they are arranged in row format okay they are arranged by row so 3 4 5 is horizontally written and so on then dime names is equal to list so dime names is nothing but your uh, dimension names it can this is for your last matrix you will see here like you have set row names row columns so that is why call one call two call three are given as dimension names for your columns similarly for your rows row one to row four is given but if you don't specify then the numbers will be mentioned this is your expected output so let's see what in our studio you will get. So on running this particular command, as expected, you will see this is your following output. Uh, I mean, these three are the different types of matrix because they are different print statements. Print M if you do. This is your first matrix, right? First matrix, if you see print M, it is just having 3, 2, 14, all the elements. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's all arranged by row because by row is set to true. So all elements are arranged sequentially by row. And uh, the number of rows are 4 over here and number of columns are three as expected and in the second case since you are specifying number of rows is four four rows will be there but by row is false that is all the elements are arranged sequentially by column now what if you say that you don't even mention by row equal to false what is the default default will be taken as false okay default will be taken as false let me run this uh, print n for you you will see the same uh, output you will see exactly the same that is 3, 4, 5, 6 is by default given uh, the elements are arranged sequentially by column. Unless and until you explicitly specify that by row equal to true, R will take it to be as a false only. So default is false. That is all elements will be arranged sequentially by column in a matrix. Okay. But if you want to arrange the elements by uh, row in a matrix, then you should specify by row equal to true and you will get something like this, which is your M matrix here the M matrix on my screen if you see 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 all and so on or horizontally or all by row wise the elements are arranged. Now the final output we were seeing is defining the column and the row name. So row names is set uh, that is row names is assigned to a vector of the row name uh, dimensions and the column names is the vector 
uh, is a vector which is of containing the names of your columns and then assigning a matrix so p is assigned to a matrix we are creating a matrix out of this um, elements 3 2 14 is the elements and if you see that is your p matrix so if you have a look at a p matrix it is containing all your elements from 3 to 14 and it is all arranged by a row so by row is 2 means all the elements are arranged sequentially by a row and dime names is a list of row names and columns so whatever row names you have assigned like row 1 to row 4 those will be given as dimension names for your rows and similarly for your columns likewise you will have column name given as column 1 column 2 column 3 and so on I hope I have made this concept of how to create a matrix and manipulate elements very clear to you. Now, go, moving forward to accessing elements in a matrix. Now, how do you exactly access elements of a matrix? As you have seen how to access them in array and a list and so on, exactly the same way we can access the element in a matrix as well. So, if you consider the P matrix we have, to access your element at the third column and first row, always your first parameter is your number of row, the second parameter is your number of column. So, it says first row. First row means one it should be passed first because that is the number of row number. The column number should be 3 because you are accessing the element of the third column. Similarly, for second column and fourth row, 4, 2 should be there. Only second row and there is no column assigned. So, simply a blank that is 2, comma without any uh, column number passed. In the next last case, if you see access only the third column, comma, comma 3 works because there is no row number specified. So, that is one way in which we can access elements. Let's have a look at it, how we can do it how we can access elements. So, suppose you have this P element and you want to access, let me show it to you in the console window itself, a console pane only, so that uh, it's not clogged up much. So, if you see this as an end matrix, let's take this end matrix, the last matrix I'm having and we want to, for example, in the last N matrix, we want to access the um, second row and the second row and the third column. So, 2 comma 3 should be mentioned. You will see 12. Is this correct? Yes, it is correct because the second row and the third column is nothing but your 12. The element is 12. So, it will be returned as output. Now, what if you are trying to access something which is not only present in your uh, in your matrix? For example, say 0, 9. Now, 0 and 9 are not even uh, indexed. They are wrong, right? So, that is why it is saying subscript out of bounds. What is subscript? Subscript is nothing but your number of columns. Okay, that is subscript. So, it says that it is out, something out of bounds. Now, let us say what is 0, 0. This will also lead to an error apparently because it will just return a 0 cross 0 matrix because in R there is nothing starting from 0. If you want to access your first element, first row and uh, no column specified, it is just going to return all the elements of your first row because you have not, spe not specified any column number to it. It will, uh, R will take it that you want to uh, access all your elements of your first row. So, your first row is 3, 7, 11. So, all the elements of your first row will be displayed. Now, if you want to um, access all your elements of your third column, so comma 3 if you do, it means all the elements of your third column will be displayed. Now, what is your third column? If you see, this is your third column, 11, 12, 13, 14. All the elements 11, 12, 13, 14 will be displayed by R to you because you have not specified which row uh, is uh, is you want to access. So, all the uh, row uh, all the uh, elements of your column will be mentioned unless you specify a row number to you know exactly specify that particular row or the exactly specify the particular column to access now matrix computations as we have seen that we can perform addition we can also perform subtraction of elements now this elements will be happening corresponding to individual elements so row by uh, basically element wise uh, computation will take place in matrix computation so uh, matrix like uh, computations like addition multiplication subtraction division these are different sub, uh, you know operations you can perform in mathematics for matrices also so you can perform matrix addition and subtraction if you, we have seen the case of addition already uh, right. If you see this, like for example, we have created two two cross three matrices. We have there is number of uh, rows is two here, and the number of columns is three. This is your matrix containing all the elements. These one and the number of rows is two. This is your matrix two having all these elements and number of rows is two here. When you add both the matrices, the result of that, if you if you see the result of that will be uh, containing a matrix, which is all the result will also be a matrix by the way. And the dimension or the number of rows and columns basically should be same for the matrices involved with the operation. So uh, basically, if this your uh, matrix uh, one is two cross three, you should always ensure that your second matrix is also two cross three. If it is a different dimension like 2 cross 2 or something, R will throw an error saying that 
the dimensions of the two matrices are not same and computation cannot be performed. So let us have a look. Like how we are seeing for addition, subtraction can also be done. And element wise, that is corresponding elements will be subtracted for both the matrices. And both the matrix uh, corresponding uh, elements will be added for your addition operation. Then you will see the result of the matrices as expected like this. So if they are also matrices can contain negative elements also. They need not only contain positive elements or zero. can also contain negative elements. This is your example for your addition and subtraction. Similarly, multiplication and division can also be performed in mat as matrix computations on your matrix, which we'll be having a look at right after we execute this addition and subtraction. Then this way you will understand how linear algebra is actually helping us to perform so many matrix calculations. And, you know, uh, it's, not, it's basic... Um, math we can say like there is nothing very um, tough actually if you see it's all based on simple addition and subtraction only operations on element wise uh, which is performed on the matrix element so this is your matrix one and this is your matrix two on running this we will see that as expected, this is your uh, this is your resulting matrix. So if you see uh, your first matrix, basically, what is your first matrix containing, right? If you see your first matrix, it contains uh, three. Then if you do addition, three plus five, right? Three plus five is eight. So you will see your result over here as eight. Then if you see nine plus two is eleven, you will see the result is eleven. Minus 1 plus 0 is minus 1. You will be seeing the result as minus 1. 4 plus 9 is 13. You will see the result as 13. 2 plus 3 is 5. You will see the result as 5. 6 plus 4 is 10. You will see the result as 10. Likewise, even for subtraction, you will see this case. That is 3 minus 5 is minus 2. You will see the output over here is minus 2. 9 minus 2 is 7. You will see as 7. Minus 1 minus 0 is minus 1. Uh, then you will see... 4 minus 9 is minus 5, which is as expected here. 2 minus 3 is minus 1. And 6 minus 4 is 2 over here. As expected, we are getting the uh, results. So what is this doing? It is element wise. You know, the first element of the first matrix is added with the first element of the second matrix. Second element of the first uh, first matrix is added to the second element of the second matrix and so on. So the nth element of the first, uh, of the first matrix is added to the nth element of your second matrix. I hope this uh, makes sense to you how uh, mat matrix-wise element operations can be done. Similarly, as we have seen how addition and subtraction is done, let us have a look at how multiplication and division is done. Now, you have two matrices. If you want to multiply, simply replace your plus or the minus operator with multiplication and division. In this way, you will get the product and the uh, division, the product and the quotient. That is the result of your multiplication and division will be mentioned. But make sure that, uh, but ensure that, uh, you know, the values of uh, assigned to the elements are correct. Sometimes what happens is it even infinity will be your output because whenever you're performing a uh, division operation, suppose you have a zero element and you know that anything divided by zero, for example, four divided by zero is infinity. Zero divided by four is give, going to give you a zero, but four divided by zero is infinity. So in that case, you will see infinity also in your matrix. Even there will be decimal, uh, decimals, fractions, you will see all these different kinds of uh, result in your, uh, as a, as a, a part of your multiplication and division sometimes. So when you, you just have to, you know, replace this plus with a, a product or asterisk, whichever operation. This is simple mathematics you can do. Similar to that, you, uh, minus can be done with the division and instead of subtract the matrices, what we are doing is divide the matrices. So divide the matrices and in the previous case, instead of add, adding the matrices, we are just multiplying the matrices. So multiply the matrices now once the two cross three matrices have been created result matrix is there result matrix we have assigned to this let us run now as expected you will see on the console window over here down the output that uh, division of the matrices is going to give us this multiplication of the matrix is going to give us this i hope i have made the concept of matrix very clear to you and matrices are indeed a very uh, easy thing see data structures in r is not a, at all a very hard concept if you understand the basic functions how they are used basic commands because r is full of commands and whenever you are stuck with any function no worries because i've already explained to you help you can just go to r help or simply just type a uh, question mark 
okay now for example you don't know anything about matrix and you just want some help or some uh, thing to learn about matrix just type help in, inside help type matrix on entering this you will get okay now if i just run this help of matrix now you will see on help of matrix you want to learn about matrix in our all the documentation in your help window this is your help window where all the description of your uh, matrices will be given to you what is a matrix what are the arguments to be passed in a matrix like data end row and column this will give us a clear understanding how exactly are different data structures and functions used in r so r is not at all a hard language to learn in, in fact it's a very uh, simple language and a most preferred language for statistical programming so this concludes your matrices concept in r now come moving on to the last data structure of r which is the factor data type in r so what is the factor this will conclude your data structure then finally after uh, after we finish factor we will have a look into the different types of operators in r and also the different for loops in r because that will give you a clear picture as to because you know the conditional operators iterative statements and your uh, operators they perform a core part of any of your programming so that will fo form the foundation of writing any programs for you because many programs will contain a lot of conditional statements right and you will be confused which for loop to use and so on uh, i mean which loop to use whether to use a for loop while loop or a repeat loop in r okay you don't have a do by loop or something you have a repeat loop in r so we will learn about the uh, looping statements later uh, once we complete factor and that will conclude your r tutorials then uh, on factor basically so factor is a data object which are used to categorize the data and store it as levels so what are different levels so if you consider this as your factor basically uh, or you should one thing you should understand is all data structures are depending on the vector only vector is your first data object which you should be very familiar in r because uh, be it a factor a matrix array everything is a combination of vectors only so you a vector is nothing but a c you have to use and a c uh, followed by inside the um, arguments to the c function you have to pass in the elements so if you are having this elements a list of this elements like east west east north and so on a list uh, vector as input so whenever you are taking a vector as input and uh, uh, assigning it to data variable printing data you will get this a list right similarly is dot factor of data if you do it is going to give you a false now what is this is dot factor it's going to check whether the uh, whether the list or the vector you have created this one data variable is it a factor or not as i told factors is data objects which are used to categorize the data and store it as levels okay now what is difference between a vector and a factor how is it different it is basically factors can store both strings and integers they are heterogeneous okay they can store both uh, strings and integers it, it's not restricted that it should only contain integer or only a string and uh, they are used in the columns which have limited number of unique values like male female true false whenever you see binary kind of output that is uh, whether yes or no something like uh, male female or something which has a limited number of unique values then we are making use of the factor so when you see a uh, in terms of statistics you have heard of the mode right mean mean and mode so mode is something which is like denoting the frequency if you see that the uh, ele uh, the values in your column are very frequent and the mode is very high then factor is a very preferable data object for you in r you can make use of factors for those columns for storing the values of those columns which contain a very high mode or a very high frequency of their uh, elements so if you see the elements of the gender column will be very high because it is only containing male female and male will be repeated many times female will be repeated many times because there are not many unique values so in such cases factor comes into picture and they are useful in data analysis for statistical modeling now let's uh, understand how do we apply the factor function uh, similar to any other data structure in order to convert anything to a factor we uh, or to any other data structure we simply write the data structure name so the data object name over here is factor inside that we pass in the parameter which is the vector we take in the vector as input to the factor function and this way we are applying the factor function now if we print factor data it will print all the elements right all the elements east west now if you observe factor is not 
containing the elements in double quotes. It will just contain the elements as levels. Okay. Now, levels, what are levels basically? Levels are the nothing but the values of all the elements which are not repeated. So, uh, basically, what are the different categories? So, factor, the sole purpose of a factor is to categorize your data. Okay. It is very much helpful for your any kind of classification, particularly binary classification in machine learning or in any um, data analytics works. So, when you do this factor data, it is going to write the levels as east north west because all east north west are the different uh, categories available in your factor okay now if you write now if you write uh, try to print is dot factor factor data it will give a true because we have applied the factor function to convert the vector into a factor now your vector has been converted to a factor having all these directions and then it will return a true as required so this is the uh, basically a factor uh, how to convert um, basically a vector into a factor. Now, after this factors in data frame, similarly, you can have a data frame, you can create any data frame with column of text data. This is a different vectors. And uh, you can create a data frame by making use of data dot frame function and passing in the corresponding vectors height, weight and gender. Once this is done, you are testing whether the uh, gender column is a factor or not, right? Now, if you just say print is dot factor input data gender to access any particular column of a data frame as we have seen dollar symbol is used so we are passing in the data frame input data and then followed by the dollar symbol and then the name of the column the name of the column is gender as we know that gender is a column where it contains very less um, unique values it will contain either a male or a false so a male or a female right something like true false yes no it's a binary kind of a classification so that is why we can say is dot factor input data call a uh, dollar gender will return a uh, true because it is a factor okay it is a factor gender column of a data frame is a factor now if we print the gender column to see the levels what are the levels levels are the categories in a factor the categories in this gender column are nothing but female and male so those will be uh, those will be returned as levels whenever you try to print uh, the um, you know the you print the uh, gender column to see what are the levels you will see that all the, the values of all the uh, rows in the gender column will be given male male female even if there are any repetitions but in the levels there is no repetition whenever you try to print the levels there is no repetition now you can change the order of levels as well this is one thing you can understand you can generate the factor levels and how do we do that is by using gl function we can generate factor levels by making use of the gl function now before go jumping into that part let us uh, hands-on understand how we can uh, basically you know uh, get uh, after creating uh, we have seen that how we can uh, take a vector and simply convert into a factor by making use of the factor command right now let's do it for the data frame as well then we can change the order of levels, which is the last part of our factor. Now, if you see this, uh, creating the vectors for data frame, these are the different vectors. Uh, one by one, we will just execute. For example, height is a vector and you want to convert the vector height to a uh, factor. So let's say height factor, height underscore factor equal to, you're converting your height vector into a factor just pass in height now you have you want to test whether it is a factor or not so what will you use is print is dot factor is dot factor will uh, you know indicate or will check whether a high, uh, factor is a factor or whether a data object in r is a factor or not now let's check if height factor is a factor we will also check if height is a factor height is not a factor but height factor is a factor Okay, because we have converted the height uh, height into a factor is dot factor of height uh, for now let me execute till here as expected you will see uh, height factor is a factor so it is returning true for is dot factor but height is not a factor it will return a false okay now we will execute everything and see now we have created the fa uh, factor factors also and we have created a data frame also now after 
creating the data frame the gender is a factor right the gender column of your data frame is a factor so when you write is dot factor of input data call a uh, uh, dollar symbol gender because you are accessing the gender column of your input data you access it by making use of the dollar symbol now you will see is dot factor input data gender as false now uh, printing the gender column to see the levels you will see this printing gender column male male female so on as the uh, different basically the different categories of your gender column so this is way in which you can access the different categories of your gender column So I hope I have made this clear. Then coming to changing the order of levels. The order of levels in a factor can be changed by applying the factor function again with new order of the levels. So you can basically mutate or you can assign a new value to a variable. So basically, if you want to change the order in which east, west and so on occur, you can change it. Of course, instead of just writing east, west, north, you can change it to a different uh, value also. You can just say uh, like west, north, east or north east west and something you can change the levels the order of the levels and you can assign it to a factor and then pass it to a different variable new order data on printing new order data you get a new level so if you see and executing the above code east west east west north and so on is the uh, basically the values of the elements we have assigned to the vector and then store it in the data data vector so you will see the levels as east north and west but you can change the order to east west north here since the uh, by making use of the uh, factor function with required order of level you are making use of the factor function here passing in the factor data which is nothing but your uh, factor then levels is equal to on making use of this uh, argument that is levels is equal to you can write the order of your levels so you can rewrite or change the order of your levels and uh, to change the order of the levels you should again use a vector here now you can uh, store it as a vector you want instead of just uh, returning levels as east north west you want to be returned as east west north so when you are specifying the level like this levels is equal to a vector of east west north elements then on printing new order data you will get the levels in this form only that is east west and north because you have passed this east west north in the uh, argument in this way you can change the order of your levels now generating factor levels gl is the function used for generating factor levels it takes two integers as input which indicates how many levels and how many times each level so when you say what is n here n is an integer giving the number of levels now number of levels are nothing but number of categories right now the number of categories so k is an integer giving the number of replications and uh, labels is a vector of labels for the resulting factor levels so if you uh, take a vector over here b and assign it to gl which is the uh, gen generating the factor level so factor level over here is assigned with the parameter in, you're passing in input parameters as three three is the number of levels so the number of levels will be three here what are the levels here tampa seattle boston there are three categories so you will see there are three elements three categories or three levels of your factor Okay, so that is why we can see here 3 is passed. Now, when you're passing 4 over here, which is nothing but the number of replications, the number of repetitions. So, the number of repetitions that is Tampa, Seattle, Boston, which is nothing but the different uh, the labels is the vector, basically. It's a vector of labels for the resulting factor label levels. So, the factor levels are these one. And you want them to be repeated 4 times. So, that's why Tampa is repeated 4 times here. Tampa, 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 as you can see here. Tampa repeated 4 times. Seattle repeated uh, four times as well. Boston also repeated four times. Now, if you're repeating each element four times, four into three is nothing but 12. So, 12 will be the total number of elements in your vector B. On printing it, you will see 12 elements because each element, that is Tampa, Seattle and Boston is repeated K number of times and K is four over here and three is, uh, N is three because that is the number of uh, levels, nothing but the number of uh, factors or uh, nothing but now number of categories in your factor. Level is a category and then on uh, this is uh, labels is the vector. So the vector is passed here. Let us execute this to understand how exactly we can make use of this GL function. GL is for generating factor levels. Okay. Now that you have understood a factor is consisting of a lot of categories is used for categorical classification and categorical data. So whenever you want any kind of a category or the levels to be generated, you can make out use of this function. GL function, which is for generating factor levels or generating level gl means generate level or level of the factor so as expected you will see now you can tune you can basically tune this or change this three and if you want the uh, uh, number to be two here 
then you can just remove Boston because there are two uh, levels. And if you want the factor to be repeated, uh, say five times now, instead of four, you want them to be, that is Tampa should be repeated five times, Seattle should be repeated five times. On generating like this, as expected, you will see in the console pane over here, you can see here. You will see that Tampa is repeated five times. Seattle is also repeated five times. So totally there are two levels. That is Tampa and Seattle. Now what if we are specifying as three over here. But remove Boston. We want the number of levels should be three. But only the uh, but the vector is having only two. Then it will return an error. Because it is found malformed factor. Malformed means badly formed factor. So we should ensure that whatever number we are providing here. Those number of elements should be present in that vector. Okay, so if you are providing it as 3, make sure some other element is also uh, given in this vector. But if you are, make, for example, you are writing 1 over here and the number of labels is 3, but you want only the label, label should be 1 only. Level should be 1. Then you will see the levels as 2. Still there are 2 level, levels, right? Tampa and Seattle are still there. But you will see the repetition also. Tampa is repeated 5 times, but Seattle is not repeated 5 times because you just specified that 1 should be your number of your levels to be considered. I hope I have made the concept of factors really clear to you. And this concludes your data objects and data types in R. Now coming to your R programming. R programming is basically comprising of two basic, uh, you know, basic foundations you should be aware of. That is your loops in R because that found uh, that um, form the basic foundation for any kind of programming and then followed by the operators. Operators is very basic like I need not explain to you since we have already used the operators for now. Let me explain you what basically we can uh, discuss in this operator concept. Operators, you know, we have also made use with like whatever I was explaining you, demonstrating you now, plus, minus, multiplication, if you have seen for merging, we have performed different computations. So those are nothing but the operators. But what are the different types of operators? Like any programming language, to perform any mathematical or logical uh, manipulations, you use operators. So arithmetic operators, what we were doing that uh, for data frames, manipulation, and matrix man manipulation, those were arithmetic operators. Arithmetic operators are these ones, like plus, minus, multiplication. As you know, these are simple uh, operators which can be used. And you can use these operators basically to add the elements of two vectors, to subtract the elements of two vectors, to multiply elements of two vectors, to div divide two vectors, and so on. And uh, these are the different arithmetic operators. Then uh, this one which is giving the remainder of the first vector with the second. If you want to basically divide the two vectors, but instead of getting the quotient, uh, like in the single one will give us a quotient, but this one will give us a remainder. That is a, a divide symbol, two times divide symbol. And if you use this result of division of the first vector with second, this will return as the quotient, which is uh, the divide followed by a slash followed by a divide. This will be nothing but the result of division of first vector with the second vector. And simply divide the first vector with second vector is nothing but like this. If you see, that is 2 by 8 is 0 0.25 that is returned here. But if you see this case, 2 by 8, the result of division of the first vector with second, the quotient will be returned. So 2 by 8, if you do, that is returning a quotient of 0. So that is what is returned here. Then if you see in this case, uh, in this case also, like 5.5 divided by 3. 5.5 divided by 3 is what? Is 1 over here. Why is it 1? Because uh, that is re returning the quotient. So, a uh, division symbol divided by division is nothing but re returning the quotient over here. But in this case, previously, 5.5 divided by 3 will also include decimal values. Division slash division will return the quotient only in the integer format. It will ensure that there is no decimal present in the result. But a simple slash will uh, also... Uh, sometimes give us a decimal value wherever there is a decimal required or wherever the, after performing division you get a decimal in your quotient. Then this operator, cap operator is the first vector raised to the vector of the second vector. Exponent of the second vector. So this is for your exponential operator basically. Uh, so if you see 2 and 8. So the first vector raised to the exponent of the second vector. So 2 power 8 is 256. That is over here. 5.5 power 3 is 166.375. 5 and then 6 power 4 is 1296. So this is your exponential operator. These are the different mathematical or nothing but the arithmetic operators. Coming to the relational operators. Then the relational operators are basically used for performing any kind of comparison. So less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than, equal to. And equal to, equal to, equality operator. These are nothing but the relational operators used for comparisons. 
logical operators like and or are used for basically joining logically to uh two operands or two expressions can be logically combined or logically joined using this logical operators assignment operator is nothing but equal to double equal to so basically assigning a value to a vari uh, assigning a variable to a value this is where assignment operator comes into picture less than followed by hyphen and equal to these are the two assignment operators in r miscellaneous operators are every other operators in r and we will have a look at enumerable uh, operators which are there in r you can have a look at this relational operators over here where greater than is to check if each element of the first vector is greater than the corresponding element of the second vector it will return a boolean result boolean means false or a true right so whenever you see that 2 is uh, basically greater than 8 it's false but if you see what is true over here the second time that's 5.5 is greater than 2.5 yes it is true so it's returning a true it is going to return a boolean similarly less than equality uh, it will check for the equality that is whether the two elements uh, are present are equal or not so if you see in these two vectors 9 and 9 are the only elements which are equal so only true is returned for the last comparison whereas other everything is false because everything uh, all the uh, corresponding vectors present in their locations or their uh, in this values are different than each other less than or equal to greater than or equal to not equal to right not equal to is nothing but a negation of your equality operator like any programming language you may know so that was all about your relational operator coming to the logical operator you have the and operator denoted by the ampersand symbol which is for uh, checking basically element wise logical and operator which combines each element of the first vector with the corresponding element of the second vector and gives a output true if both the elements are true so if both are true it returns a true if if one of them is true one is false it still returns a false because it should check that both the uh, values of the uh, operands should be true that is why it's called as a logical and operator then this is a uh, basically uh, called as the element wise logical or operators denoted by a pipe symbol and if the com it combines each element of the first vector with the corresponding element of the second vector and if either one of them either one of the two elements uh, corresponding to the vectors is true it will return a true else it will return a false this is uh, called as a logical logical not operator which takes a negation or the opposite of your value so 3 the opposite uh, if you print like this 3 is considered to be true the opposite of true is false is going to return a false 0 is to, uh, considered to be a false the opposite of false is true it will return a true here opposite of true is of course false and 2 plus 2y is nothing but true taken as true because there is some value assigned so wherever there is some value other than 0 it is considered to be true by default if you perform negation on true it will return a false and as expected you will see false over here so logical operator ampersand and pipe considers only the first element of the vectors and gives a vector of the single element as output so this is something like double uh, ampersand double pipe right this is nothing but the uh, takes first element of both the vectors and gives true only if both are true so it takes the first element of both the vectors over here so it, uh, only one output the difference between a single ampersand and double ampersand is that uh, double ampersand is for element wise so all the elements are compared to each element but then in this double ampersand only the first elements are considered so 3 and 1 is only considered 3 and 1 both of them are true it will return a true in pipe also 0 and 0 so 0 or 0 both of them are false uh, or performing or operation on the false will return a false value coming to the assignment operator these is the assignment operator as i have explained this is the different ways in which you can assign values to your variables this is called as a left assignment operator similarly you can also do a right assignment operator where your value will come on the right hand uh, the left hand side and the variable will come on your right hand side this is called as a right assignment operator then it will also produce a similar result by the way then these are the miscellaneous operators so the other operators which have their own unique purposes or there's something for uh, they're not generally used but there are some other operators which are present in r you can all you can explore all these uh, miscellaneous operators in your r documentation as well you can have a look for a while this is nothing but the in operator by the way this is the colon operator for your sequence we have used this in our uh, practical demonstration if you remember while writing the programs i have made used many times the uh, the series to generate a sequence or a series of numbers i've used the colon operator then this is for multiplying a matrix with this transpose you can see this is you know you can multiply matrices and their transpose also instead of multiplying two matrices a matrix multiplied to its transpose can also be done this for doing that you make use of this um uh, this operator whereas in operator is used to check or to identify if an element belongs to a vector so if you want to check if uh, 
basically the vector v1 is present in the vector t or it belongs to the vector t as a part of the vector t it will return a true because a it is a part of the sequence 1 to 10 but what about 12 12 which is a vector 2 is not a part of the sequence 1 to 10 hence a false is returned here so it is check uh, used in operator which is used to identify if an element is belonging to a vector or not I, these are the various three miscellaneous miscellaneous operators in r I hope I have made this concept of operators really clear to you. Coming to our last slide, which is nothing but the loop scenario, because this form of, uh, you know, uh, foundation, conditional, whether we are given any uh, question or any question to solve in R programming, then how you can identify whether any kind of uh, loop has to be used or not, because there are a lot of conditions given to us in the question, right? Any constra constraints and conditions. So there is a control structure is very important to be understood in R because that will help us to decide the flow. So for loop, while loop and repeat loop are the different three types of loops in R programming. Uh, basically, I'll be skimming through the skin syntax for you. So if you see, this is the for loop we have made use in our demonstration of uh, in our first or the second video I have explained you how to write a user defined function so basically to create a user defined function I had made use of a for loop inside I can also show you right now we have made use over here in this uh, R script of ours which I was explaining before I have made use of the for loop okay this is the if condition basically conditional statement for while and do while loop is basically for iterating so whenever you are the iterating operations because of basically whenever you want to recurse or you want to uh, basically you know that recursion will take a lot of time right although it's very easy and comprises the code it's very easy to write but it will take a lot of time so uh, time means order to decrease the time complexity always it's better to make use of some looping statements because they are iterative in nature they help us to re uh, repeat a particular logic or a particular body of function so if you see this for loop we have made use of this for loop and we write for i in 1 to n so colon is used for basically generating a sequence so 1 to n all the sequence of numbers will be generated similarly this is a uh, nested for loop because the for loop is this is the inner for loop this is the outer for loop we have made use of the for loops over here while writing the program i have explained you how we can make use of the for loop then similarly we have the while loop also where we are providing a condition as parameter to the while loop and then there's a nested while loop and then we write the body inside this we write the logic for our while loop followed by the updation of the counter variable so this i'm just skimming through this code so that you can understand how for while loop can be used and then finally we can make use of the inbuilt functions at the end so now that you have understood how we have made use of the for and while loop, let me skim through your syntax so that you can understand basic syntax for any kind of uh, for loop. This is the syntax. So this is the program to display numbers from 1 to 5 using for loop in R. So let, let us cover a few programs now so that it will be a, a helpful for you to write for any kind of whenever you are writing any program, you can make use of these loops. So to display numbers from 1 to 5 using for loop, we can just make use of this. Let me clear this as well. Okay. Uh, for val in 1 to 5 now there is an iterable and an iterator here iterator is 1 to 5 sequence because you're iterating over that body of text okay let's just make it over here for loop for i in 1 to 5 and then inside the body you can just write any logic here we just want to print those elements so print i print val or print i that's it So as expected, you will see 1 to 5, all the numbers have been printed because you want to print the numbers from 1 to 5 using for, uh, for loop. This is the way, syntax. Then uh, coming to the next program to display the weeks of a uh, days of a week. So you are assigning this uh, week 1 with a vector. And then you can iterate over, instead of iterating over a list uh, 1 to 5, you can iterate over this vector also by saying for day in week 1, print day. This will print all the weeks all the days of the week so 
So say that instead of for loop, now you want to have this, you have this week and you want to print all the days of your week. And week one is the vector. So as you can see, Sunday to Saturday, all the days of the week have been printed. And all, whatever variables you are keep going on adding, those will be appended and added to your environment over here. In your R workspace, you can also delete them whenever you want. So let's let me clean it for now. While loop. Now coming to the while loop, this is the syntax. Instead of having a counter variables right in your uh, starting statement also or a counter variable, you can just have a condition, the statement and then any kind of updation, increment, decrement of your counter variable can be done inside the function body itself. So if you see here, there's an example to display numbers from 1 to 5 using now converting your while loop over here to a, uh, the for loop to a while loop. Initialization of your uh, variable has to be done before only. So before entering into your while loop, val1 is assigned to 1. Then you just give a conditional statement inside your as parameter to your while loop and then print value and increment operator that is your up, uh, incrementing or updating the value of your variable val one by one has to be done inside your uh, body of function body itself inside your loop itself while loop. so on running this you will get one two five all the numbers one two three four five so this is the difference you know for loop we are writing the uh, increment the condition and also the initialization in the same uh, input parameters to your while loop but over here we are passing it as a condition to your while loop, the initialization has to be happening before entering into the while loop. Coming to a program to calculate factorial of a number, this is the way in which you know factorial is basically a user defined function, right? You can create a user defined function of a factorial as well, or you can just simply make use of a, a while loop as well. So, you know, factorial is nothing but this is a logic factorial into the number and then you increment the number right factorial is the product of all the numbers starting from one up to the number itself so, so for example if i say five factorial then it is uh, basically one into two into three into four into five which is 120 so starting from one all the numbers will be multiplied up to that particular number so up to the particular number means it should be less than or equal to n n is the value of that number so let's say you want to calculate five factorial it will be giving 120 as the output. This is the assignment uh, operator, by the way. You can make use of. It is going to give us a 120. So this is a factorial of a number. Then let's go to that factorial of a number. Let us assign some value to n, like instead of 5, this time let's say 6. And we want to get the factorial of 6. On running this, you get 6 factorial as 720 because uh, 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 into 5 into 6 is 720 or simply 5 factorial into 6. That is 120 into 6 is 720. So that is what how factorial can be done. Now coming to repeat loop, which is your last looping statement in R. What is repeat loop? It is a simple loop. It will run the same statement or group of statements repeatedly until the stop condition has been encountered. So there should be some break conditions to in your repeat loop. It's something similar to your do while loop, do while loop, which is in Java. Similar to that, only repeat loop is a third kind of your loop and it does not have any condition to terminate the loop. Okay, there is no condition. A programmer must specify, place a condition within the loop's body and use the declaration of a break statement to terminate the loop. A break is a must in order to terminate the loop. Otherwise, it will go on repeating infinitely. Okay. And if that is infinitely, it goes on repeating, it's a timeout for us. So, we should ensure that uh, there is a break statement which is provided or declared inside your uh, body of your repeat loop. So, if no condition is present in the body of the repeat loop, then it will iterate infinitely. This is your syntax of your repeat loop. Repeat followed by the statement, if condition and then the break. So, value assign value equal to 1, repeat. You're printing the value over here, then incrementing it. And then this is your break uh, statement because you want the uh, loop to break if the value exceeds 5. You're starting from 1 and then ending. You want only to print the uh, values from 1 to 5. But whenever you see that it is exceeding 5, that is if you if the value becomes 6, then a break is encountered and you come out of your loop. Let us execute this repeat loop. Repeat uh, for repeat loop, repeat 
keyword is a must as for for loop for we are using for while while we are using for repeat repeat is a must and the condition is not provided here but then you are providing a if statement here and then the break condition so break statement is provided whenever you want to come out of the loop so as expected you will see all the numbers from 1 to 5 will be given as output 1 2 3 4 5 will be the output generator of your repeat loop repeat is the keyword here now coming to the coming to the program where we are using this is a program another program to display a statement of five times so this is basically again a repeat loop uh, basically whenever you want geeks for geeks this is the uh, this is the statement you want it to be repeated five times so you can ensure that if i equal to equal to five instead of saying i uh, greater than five you can just say i equal to equal to five and break the loop then you will get the statement repeated five times it's a similar variation of your previous code only then coming to the jump statement now that you have understood what is break and how to terminate a loop what is exactly this jump statement so jump statement in loop is basically to terminate the loop at a particular iteration or to skip a particular iteration in the loop the two most commonly used jump statements are break statement which is the jump uh, kind of jump statement and the next statement. So this basically are used to transfer your control or to uh, you know pass the control flow from one statement to another statement. That is called as your different uh, jump statements in loop. So break statement and next statement. Break statement, uh, break is the keyword in the jump statement that is used to terminate the loop at a particular iteration. As we have seen in our example as well, this was the jump statement over here because it is used for termination of our uh, statement termination of our loop so that is why this is called as a jump statement instead of break if we had used next here can you guess what is output instead of break if you have used next here you will see it keeps on repeating continuously it is not even terminating at all now how do we quit this okay instead of now if we say instead of next if we say Yes, finally, after clicking on that uh, stop button, then it stopped. It means next statement will continuously repeat. In fact, it is not oh, breaking the loop anytime. But if we just, uh, as soon as we say break, then it will break the statement and come out of the loop. So that was the difference. So break statement is a jump statement used to terminate the loop at a particular iteration. So if the value becomes 3, then the break statement will execute and the loop will terminate. In our case, if this is the value, it executes 3. Only 1 and 2 will be printed because as soon as 3 is reached, it will become a break and come out of the loop. But had it been a next over here, then it will just not print 3. It will print 1, 2, 4, 5. We can just check out here. As expected, you will see 1, 2, 4, 5 when you were using a next statement. So next statement is a jump statement also, but instead of terminating the loop, completely it will use to skip a particular iteration in the loop so it is used for it's like a skipping statement both of them are used for jumping but break is for completely terminating your loop but next is used for skipping it's something like continue if you have heard continue in the other programming languages like java and so on you have the continue keyword so instead of like continue we have something called as next in our r programming language so that is a jump statement which is used to skip a particular iteration so if i use this now It will just print uh, if uh, it will just do uh, I uh, one two four five. In our case, if we had used uh, next over here, why it was like not even start uh, stopping is because it was going on printing the values, incrementing the values, and if value is greater than five, next it is going to uh, still execute this continuously. There was no nothing like stop at all for it. But in this case, you will see that there is a nested, like if condition is provided inside repeat and, okay, this is, let's say if val equal to equal to 5, then we will say next. Okay, it's from 1 to 5, so let's make it as if val equal to equal to 3 next and we have also used a for loop over there so for uh, val so uh, uh, instead of repeat let's say it's a for only
for val in one two five. On running this, print of val, yes, we have to also print it. So somewhere the value should be printed and as expected, you will see 1, 2, 4, 5. Yes, 1, 2, 4, 5 as your output of your uh, for loop whenever you're using a next. Now, what if you used a break here? instead of a next it will completely come out of the loop at all and will just give you one and two as the output see it's just giving us one and two uh, once the three is encountered it will not at all uh, you know continue the for loop it will just come out of the for loop and print but instead of break if you use a next it will skip it will act like a skipping statement or a skipping clause and then continue Right, so we can conclude that from the above two programs, basic difference between the two jump statements is that break statement terminates the loop and the next statement skips a particular iteration of the loop. Right, whenever you want to skip the current iteration of the loop, then you can use the next statement. So that is what, and this concludes your uh, iterative statements as well. Basically your looping statements, which are the three loops for while and repeat loop and uh, I hope I have given a clear picture about how, what is R programming, an introduction to R Studio, and how exactly R plays a very important role for us to understand and manipulate data using different functions, the history of R, the various features of R Studio and R, and how it is a very dynamic language and versatile language for statistical programming. So if you have any doubts, feel free to drop in the comment section and do like, subscribe, and share with your friends who, uh, who you think that uh, this video might help in their our uh, learning so happy learning thank you